get, let's get 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you will, this morning. And uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 4, and 1 Thessalonians 2. I'm going to um, teach this morning what I taught Wednesday night at the Bible conference. Uh, one, because some of us didn't, weren't able to, didn't know it was streaming or weren't able to or whatnot. Two, because we need to talk about it again. And uh, not that you guys are deficient or anything, it's just, it's good reminder. And then three, it helped me, I just got to really thinking about it. But the, um, uh, the, the issue here, the title is Grace Age Suffering. That was my title and so forth, and uh, we'll uh, talk about that. Uh, you've got the three passages, I hope, we'll look at it. The, the joke that Joe wants me to tell you is there was... In the foyer of a church building, there's a plaque that had listed all the men and women who had died in the armed services that was a part of that church. And one Sunday morning, the little boy was back there, and he's looking at him, and he's got a really serious look on his face. And the pastor comes up and says, you know, what's wrong, Johnny? And he's like, well, what's all this, these names? And he's, the pastor says, it's, well, all those men died in service. The little boy goes, which one, the 930 or the 11? <laughs> so there you go. All right? But, um, that's funny. Okay. Uh, so I do that for, uh, for my brother Joe. Okay? Um, and you can think about that one. I, have, I get them, and they come to me. And, and uh, during the, I was talking to Linda during the week through text. And uh, I said, hey, I'm going to tell a couple jokes. She goes, no. And I said, really? And I said, why? And she goes, okay, two, not long and not stupid. So I told four or five, you know. They were short. There were five of them. Actually, I had a sixth one, but I didn't quite do it. And I was like, uh. But uh, the, the one of them, uh, Joe said, was my worst, which was what, about a black cat. And uh, nobody, well, it's because I didn't, wasn't able to set it up right, you know. And uh, you know how people say uh, when a black cat crosses your pathway, it's bad news. And, uh, but really, if you think about it, why does the black cat cross your path? Because it's going somewhere. Bottom. Okay. See, still stuck with the first one? Okay. All right. Well, you got to think about that one. Well, I don't know. Have you ever wondered what your dog has named you? Or your cat named you? Uh, uh, bad. Okay. First, second Tim. Say, I, I told you, we can lay them good. We can lay good. What's that? That was the other service. <laughs> the, the 11 o'clock one. All right. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 2 with me. And uh, we're going we're gonna to start here and look at verse number 7. And obviously, uh, when you teach at a Bible conference and so forth, the audience is completely different than you guys. Because I know you folks. And, and you're, you're my people. You're my folks. And uh, so we're going to say some things different than what I said that evening um, because in that crowd, there were people that struggle with this. We, everybody struggles with the issue of suffering. It's just the way it is. But when you come, and, 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 I, and, and, and I've all, these three verses that I just gave you, I always think about it, a lot of stuff with this understanding. Look at verse 7 of 2 Timothy 2. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. What does Paul say? He says to consider, doesn't he? Okay, consider. Consider what I say. We're going to think about it. We're going to pay attention to it. We're going to go to Paul because Paul's our apostle. We're going to come to the Word of God rightly divided. By the way, when you talk about suffering, if you don't rightly divide the issue of suffering, you'll be back over in Israel's program trying to name and claim something that will never come your way. It'll lead to frustration. It'll lead to heartache. It'll lead to what-ifs. And when you come to the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 2, or 1 Timothy 4 now, okay, when you come to Paul and you consider what Paul says about a subject, we're going to talk about suffering, you can talk about any subject this way and do this little three little remedy here. Verse number 13, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Paul's talking to, to Timothy, he says, Till I come, give attendance to what? Notice where reading is... Where reading is listed in the list, it's, be, it's the first thing he says, doesn't it? Then he talks about exhortation and doctrine, you know. But he says, first thing you need to do is read. Because there's a lot of times when we read things, we read things in the verses that don't belong there. 
Okay, I'll show you in just a minute when we talk about suffering. He says, no, I need you to consider what I say, and I need you to read the verses. Come over to 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, and verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? And there's number three, the issue of believing. So when you approach this subject, what are you going to do? We're going to consider our apostle and what he says about the topic. We're going to read the verses, okay? And then we're going to believe the verses. You follow that? 2 Timothy 2.7 1 Timothy 4.13, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, okay? What are we going to do? Consider, read, and believe. CRB, okay, if you need an acronym. Because when you look at some of this stuff, now come back to 2 Timothy 2. And, and, and this was my text passage in the meeting, and it's kind of where we're going to launch from today. But I want you to look at this, the, this faithful saying here, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, see that? We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not that he himself, yet he himself, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. That's a faithful saying. That means it's true all the time. But in verse 12, it says, if we suffer. Now, most people, some people, will put in, if we suffer for him, if we suffer with him. But that's not in the verse, is it? See that? So don't read that into this. Because when he says, if we suffer here, that's a fact, Jack, as Silas would say. Okay? As Osai would say. That's not a, if you suffer with him, then maybe. That's, it's not a maybe, it's a fact. It's a fact of life. You know, um, I was there at the conference center. We're upstairs and they have an elevator for us young folks so we can go up and down easy. And uh, it says, in case of fire, use the stairs. Do you know what you're supposed to do in case of a fire? Use the stairs. That in case of fire is a fact, isn't it? See, so when you, we talk here about the if, we suffer. A lot of times people make a lot of stuff out about the word if. If is a conditional clause, but it's also a factual clause. If you are my son, there's no doubt that my son's my son. Look at him. There's no doubt that he's my son. That's a fact. But if you're my son, you're going to act a certain way. You're going to do something. So when we talk here and we look at this passage here, 2 Timothy is a wonderful book. I know we're studying 1 Timothy, and the, and the issues in 1 Timothy are the local assembly in, in, in being set up and running the show and the, and the mode and the operandi of how God's doing the work of the ministry today and the body of Christ is through local assemblies. 2 Timothy, the last book he writes, is a, that local assembly is now off in apostasy. It's off in ruin. It's, 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 it's not impacting the society and the culture around it at all anymore. So when you think about suffering, look back up, look at the context here. It's just an interesting thing to me how he talks about this. Look in verse 1. If thou therefore, thou therefore my son be, what? Why would he have to tell Timothy to be strong unless there's some things going on over here that got him down? He's suffering. Verse 3, thou therefore, what? Endure hardness. So you've got to be strong, you've got endure. Verse 4, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The word war, when the guys go off to war, are, are they going to have cocktails on the beach? Not at all. They're going in to do what? They're going to go in and suffer something, aren't they? Whether it's the taking of life or, or having life taken around them or whatever. That's a, that's a war, that's a fight, a battle. 
Verse 5, and if any man also strive. When you're striving, is that going up and having a nice day off at the spa? No, not at all. It's what? It's work. It's, that's why he'll say, verse 6, that the husband that laboreth. And I, we're, I'm not looking at the details of the doctrine. I want you to notice the thinking and the terminology here that Paul's using. Striving, being strong, endure, work, wrath, labor. Verse 9, wherein I suffer. Verse 10, therefore I endure. He's talking about things of life, isn't he? Now again, he's talking to Timothy. He's talking to the leadership in the local assembly. But where does the leadership in the local assembly come from? Comes from you guys. So he's really now talking to who? Everybody. And he says, look, you're in a battle. You're going to war. You're going to endure. You're going to, because I've decided to leave you there to be my ambassador, you're going to suffer. You're going to get sick. You're going to hurt. And you're going to die if I tarry. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Right? But notice verse 11. This is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also... Boy, isn't that a wonderful thing to know? That because of Calvary and the fact... You go back over there to, Rome, go back over there to Romans 6. I think about this, and by the way, I taught this Wednesday night. It'll be completely different because you think of everything you didn't say Wednesday night, you're going to say it today, <laughs> right? So anyway... Then you think of everything you're going to say today, and you didn't say when you didn't miss Wednesday night, and that Wednesday night was good, you know, and today is okay. Well, look at look at Romans 6, look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in the what? Just as we are identified completely in His death, burial, and resurrection, we're, we're so complete in Him. We're so connected. We're so code with Him. Codified. Put together with Him. That He says back here in 2 Timothy 2, man, we're dead with Him. You know what we're going to do? We're going to live with Him. And the nonsense and the mess that he, we got to deal with here right now in time will be nothing to compare to the glory that's coming. And what we go through here and how we handle the issues of life here, now. Boy, what a great hope we have in verse 11, back in 2 Timothy 2 now, of the issue of, man, we, we died with him, we're going to what? Live with him too. Verse 12, if we suffer. And again, you got to read that carefully there. Too often times we're tempted to say, well, if you suffer with him. All right, if you suffer over here, no, that's a factual statement. And let me show you, using some verses, that's a factual statement. Come to Romans 8 and verse 18. Because what are we doing? We're considering what Paul says, we're reading the verses, and then what are we going to do? We're going to believe the verses. So let's consider them. Romans 8, 18. Romans 8 and verse number 18 i got to get there. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I reckon that the suffering of what? This present time. The very nature, the very environment of the dispensation of grace is an environment of suffering. See that in that verse? For I reckon that the suffering of this present time. Now there's other th things going on in that environment, but the underlining fu fundamental issue today is an issue of suffering. Come over to Philippians 1 and get 1 Thessalonians 3. Do 1 Thessalonians 3, verse number 3 first. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 3. So the very nature of suffering, the very nature of the body of Christ today is suffering. By the way, it's been that way since Paul and the Lord met on the road to Damascus. You go back and you look at Saul of Tarsus and what he was wreaking havoc of the, of the little flock. 
He's converted on the road to Damascus. And you know what Satan does? Satan moves from that persecution of the little flock right over to persecuting Paul in the beginning of the, and the, and the members of the body of Christ over there. And so you can see it just suffering. Now in little flock terminology, if they blessed, if they uh, kept the commandments and everything, what was going to happen to them? They would get a blessing. If you don't, you're going to get a curse. By the way, every time you read in your Old Testament about a famine, there's a famine in the land, you better go back and study that out of why the famine is there. And 10 out of 10 times is because they disobeyed the Word of God somewhere. Every, almost every time. Famine of, whim, of uh, with women having children. Fam, fam, you, boy, you got to pay attention to that. Because what did he say? If you keep, I'm going to bless you. If you don't, I'm going to curse you. And you're not doing it, so guess what? You ain't having kids anymore. You're not going to have food anymore. No rain. You look at Elijah, no rain. He makes it rain one day and not the next. <laughs> He's a, you and I, we can't do that. We're just going to suffer. That's our environment. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, that no man should be moved by these, look at that, afflictions, sufferings. Trouble for, more further explanation here, yourselves, look at that, No. How do these guys at Thessalonica know that they are appointed thereunto? How do they know that suffering is the environment that we're living in? The afflictions that they're, they've been going through. Because Paul's standing there teaching them Romans 8.18. <laughs> he's already he's un, he's been teaching this to them. Come over to Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1. So when we talk about suffering, you're not, and, and you can suffer in many different ways, and, and I'm not trying to get into all of that. I just want you to understand that when you do that, there's the reason behind it. You're going to have to consider, read, and believe to keep yourself sane. Okay? Look at Philippians 1. Look at verse 29 and 30. Philippians 1 verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ... Not only to believe on Him. Boy, isn't that a great thing? To believe on Him. To have the security. To have everything set for you. To have that identity for you. But that's not the end of the story. But also to what? Suffer for His sake. Now there's the suffering for Him. See that? Having the same conflicts which you saw in me and now here to be in me. When these... When these Guys at Philippi, verse 28, are terrified by their adversaries. You know what Paul's telling them? You need to consider what I told you about this. You need to read, go back there and reread those books, and you need to believe them because what I told you was that you are appointed to do this mess, to this suffering. Okay? Mess. Then the question gets to be, well, why do we suffer? Real quickly, run back to Romans 8. Three general ways, you, I mean, and, and again, I say, I, I say general because you can dissect this stuff down until you got a headache, and I don't want to do that with you this morning. I just give you some, here's the, the things. Romans 8, if you look at verse 18 again, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature... Waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children. I'm sorry, of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and tra travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also. What do we know? We live in a sin-cursed creation, don't we? We live in a situation and an environment, not only dispensationally of one of suffering and, and the environment, but also around us, culture, in, in the cre By the way, notice it's creature, creature, creation. Isn't that interesting? The creature, the creature. And then he goes, the creation. We're all in the bondage of corruption. So when, when things happen to you, one of the reasons is, is because sin abounds. And it's what's in control. Come over to Galatians chapter 6. 
Galatians chapter 6. So when things come up to you and start happening to you, you know what you can say? Well, okay, it's going to happen because I, I went to get on the airplane to go back to Chicago on Friday. Uh, I took the, the day off. We were going to get on the airplane, go Friday. I get to the airport. We check in. I'm sitting there, and, and, and I took my cell phone and put it on airplane mode so I could save some of the battery. I'm sitting there. I'm reading a book, you know. And all of a sudden, all these people are walking by me, and I'm like, that's not good. So I look up. They canceled the flight. So now I go, cause I, and I because I stopped somebody, what's going on? Oh, they canceled the flight. I'm like, they did what? <laughs> so now I'm putting my cell phone back off of airplane mode, and American Airlines is just ding, 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 bouncing in on me. And, and I'm like, weather? We got no weather here. What was weather in Chicago? Big bad storm coming in, and they can't. So they call the 1-800 number, and we got you rebooked. And I'm sitting there going, no, you don't. <laughs> there ain't no way. So I call, guess what? They had me rebooked on the next morning flight. But you know what? For the moment, you could have did what? You could have fell to pieces. Actually, there were several families that did fall to pieces right there. Just, oh, you know, and, and I can understand why, because it was mom and dad and three little ones. They had three little ones on one plane and mom and dad on another. Well, they don't know ages. They just know names, you know, and they were all up there. I would have fell to pieces, too, because I don't want to have been on another plane. You know, just let them go. It'll be okay. <laughs> they're, they, they're, they're old enough. They can take care of themselves, you know. Just keep them in Chicago for me. I'll pick them up on the way out. But the thing of it is, is you could all of a sudden go, what? Now, why did that happen? Why did that moment happen to me? Because of, the, of weather, something I couldn't control. See that? That's why that happened. Galatians 6. Look at verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the, his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know what? Folks, you make dumb decisions. And when you make a decision, what are you going to do? You're going to reap what you just sowed there, aren't you? So if you're over here, you know, the, the storm, if, you, if you're in that situation and you fall to pieces, you made a decision to fall to pieces. There's nothing the airline can do for you. See, I asked the lady, because I went by the customer service booth just to get a verbal yay or nay from someone I could look in the eye, you know. And I said, where's my bag? Because all my... Drugs are in my, my, my pills are in, in they, I put them in the bag, not on purpose, on accident. And she goes, oh, well, we got it. It's rebooked. It'll, it'll meet you in Chicago. <laughs> and she goes, seriously, it'll meet you in Chicago. <laughs> That's ex her words exactly. And I'm, still going, I'm like, okay, well, I know a lady that works down there. I, you know, if there's a problem, I'll just call Debbie and we'll get this thing ironed out right now. She goes, you know Debbie? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I didn't know. She, I didn't say that to her. She, I'm just giving, I'm just... That's a joke, ha, 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 okay. No, but what do you do? Well, you can make a decision to what? Fall to pieces and make a scene and get nowhere. They can't do anything with you. Actually, I talked to the lady on the phone, and she goes, well, we could send you to San Diego and catch the flight from San Diego to Chicago, but you'll be stuck in San Diego because everything going into Chicago from the West is canceled. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'd rather go home and sleep in my own bed, thank you. You know, I don't want to do that. But you're going to reap what you sow, the decisions you make. Man, if you make a good decision and everything works out, it's like, all right, cool. You make a bad one, guess what's going to happen? Oh, man. So when things begin to happen, you got a couple avenues here, don't you, to look at. Come over to 2 Timothy 3. Here's the third one, and here's the one that's important out of this. Well, they're all important. So you're going to suffer when suffer happens, whatever it is, whatever it form it takes. A lot of times we think about our health. Okay, right now, I, my legs just ain't making it right now. But I know what I did yesterday, the last two days. Say, climbed a mountain or eight or three, you know. Jeff goes, you're the mule, put it on. <laughs> put the, right, put the pack on. And we get to the tree, and he goes, he had to go up the tree. I'm not going up the tree. I'm down here going, <laughs> guy we're with, he goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah, my heart's just catching up. Hang on, you know. 
I'm out of shape. Hey, I, you know, I enjoyed the Dunkin' Donuts, you know, <laughs> do <Do-nuts. laughs> It was pretty good, you know, but I understand. You, you get that. Most of the time when we suffer, we think about physical stuff. But look at this one in 2 Timothy 3, verse number 12. Yea, and all that will live godly. But live godly where? In Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The reason I paused and said it that way is because you can live godly in Israel's program. You can look good, smell good, taste good, say the right stuff, and be completely free of any trouble because you're in the wrong program. You consider what Paul says, you read it, and you believe it. The three reasons why, in a very general way, that you're going to suffer, the sin-cursed creation, the decisions you make, and the fact that you've chosen to live godly. You've chosen to live a life of godliness, where his life is then going to live out through your life. And when you come back a page to 2 Timothy 2.12, and he talks about if we suffer, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about in the present distress, in the present moment of the local assembly falling away, and the local assembly not doing, which means the members of the local assembly aren't doing. He says, in that moment, Timothy, you need to live godly. You need to stand for the truth. You didn't need to take care of business. You're, re- you're looking there. I don't want to miss verse, the rest of verse 12. If we, uh, we shall also reign with him. There's our places in heaven, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all. That issue of reign, we've looked at that. We've studied that here. The judgment seat of Christ and all of those events. Then he says, if we deny him. What happens at the judgment seat of Christ? Everything, your life is on, look look over there. I I, I don't want to say it's all on display because then you think that I'm going to sit there and watch you and laugh at you and eat my popcorn and drink my soda. On that day, we all give an accounting of ourselves, don't we? And when you do that, I often thought about that verse. We're talking about every man's going to give an account for himself. What do you got to say that's going to please God? Absolutely nothing. That's the wood, hay, and stubble. That's the deny. What are you going to, what accounting are you going to give? I tell you what, it ain't I, but Christ. It wasn't me, Lord. It was you. That's the accounting I'm going to give. That's the proclamation that needs to be given. Because there's going to be some turkey that's going to stand up there and say, well, you know, Lord, I was doing this, this, and this. And he's going to go right on the fire burner, and off it goes. And he's going to say, no, you need to, do, you need to, be in, you need to understand where you are, which is in me. The reigning there. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. That denial there is at the judgment seat of Christ. Because at the reigning and, and the judgment seat of Christ, then we get that capacity measured of your inner man. You're presented to the Father, and the Father takes you and puts you out there in those heavenly places. You with me? Remember, do you remember all those studies? I hope you do. 1 Thessalonians 3, if you need a verse, go over there real quick. 1 Thessalonians 3. By the way, if you come next Sunday morning, we're going to talk about the issue of, of the heavens and so forth uh, and during the first hour. Uh, in our, because we're in First Timothy four, we're going to get there here in just a minute. First Thessalonians uh, chapter three verse thirteen: To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. That's that step after the judgment seat. Where the uh, First Thessalonians four, the trumps sounds, the voice shouts, the 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 uh, the um. The shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump, all that happens. The body of Christ is is, is raptured up or caught up together. We meet the Lord in the air. We go through the judgment seat of Christ where he sits there and looks at you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9 and 10. And he says, hey, we want our labor to be accepted of him because we all know we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And whatever we've done in this body is going to be good or bad. We're getting it. Well, what would the good be? 
That a boy, good job. What's the bad? The denial, the way away with it, the turn the fire up. Then he takes us and presents us to the Father, the body as a whole, without spot and blemish, Ephesians 5 says. And the Father says, well done, my son. They're looking good today, finally. They're looking really good. The Lord leaves that scene and comes back down into the, into the universe, into the second heaven, and goes to war with Michael and the angels and Satan and begins to clean out the heavens for you and I. Meanwhile, back up at the ranch, with the Father in the third heaven, he looks at the capacity, the certificate of this is what your capacity is, and here you are, and now this is your job to go and do. And you'll do it just as Mark 10 when he looks at his disciples and say, you guys are thinking about my kingdom and running my kingdom like the Gentiles think, where you're going to lord over. And he says, the, the son didn't come to, he came to serve. The son didn't come to lord over, he came to seek and to serve. Service is the issue in the third heaven. That's the issue out there, that's the reigning with him. Here's your job, here's your job. We all, all the body fitly joined together. Paul says, that's a fact. That's how it's going to happen. Verse 13, if we believe not, isn't that a great thing? There's the opportunity for you to say, no. If we believe not, yet he, what? Abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Isn't that a great verse? That is such a tremendous verse because you know what happens is, is that you get saved, then you begin to come to understand the Word of God rightly divided, and then you begin to grow, and you know what happens? Someone comes along and says, yeah, you know what, but have you really ever looked at this? And you know what you begin to do? You begin to not consider. You begin to not to read. You begin to not to believe. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to be the most shocked individual when the Lord calls everybody home because guess where you're going? home. Follow me? Because the moment you said, I believe, I trust the Lord, what did he put on you? Ephesians 1.13. A seal. A seal of ownership. You're not his. What? No, you're not. You've been bought with the price. I paid the price for you. You belong to me. And if you choose not to live a godly life and not to live for him and to forsake it all and let it just run, you know what you can't get out of? Going home. Follow me? That's a bunch of amens, hallelujah, praise the Lord, let's run the aisle stuff right there. Hey, thank you, sir. Finally get one amen. I got another one a minute ago. That was even good. Y'all got to wake up. It's only Sunday morning. Come on. Because that's what's going on here. Now look at this issue about suffering. Come over to 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. This past week was one year with the, uh, the event that happened with Lisa and the kids. It was Tuesday, last, a year ago. That's tough. We've been a year removed from that event. For those of you who weren't here, she uh, killed the kids, shot them, and then committed suicide. Mom, two children, boom. Then she killed herself. Devastation. Look at 2 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> Helps if I get there. <laughs> Verse 17. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. That's a little tough when things like that happen. 2 Corinthians 2, 17. No, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Thank you. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. I am so sorry. Notice that. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and making manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. You know, when that event happened, it, it was tough. We, you know, we worked through it as a church family, as individuals. Some of us still have, you know, struggles with it. By the way, that's natural. That's normal. I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest with you. 
You know why I say that? Because my personality and how I deal with things is completely 180 degrees different than you. And for me to stand here and say, you got to handle it my way, would be so inappropriate, so wrong. But what do we do? We consider the verses, what Paul said. We read the verses. And then the key is going to be the believer in the verses. What does that verse say? Well, it's always triumphing where, though? In Christ. Where does our folk, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks to Christ. Not for everything, but what? In everything. Man, you could be having the best day of your life, and what are you to be doing? Giving thanks. Because, man, when you have a worse day, and we've had some, what are you supposed to be doing? Giving thanks. Because where's the victory? Where is the triumph? It's in Christ. It's in the Word, understanding what Paul has told us about the issues of suffering, that the fact that there's suffering, and that's just the facts. We got there with Dave and Lisa and all that, not by any of us making a decision, not by any of us living godly or not living godly. We got there because of Romans 8 and the sin-cursed creation. That's why that event happened. Okay? When you boil that bad boy down to the crux, that's what's going on. Sin is what happened there. You follow me? And just as you get as angry at it, you might as well double it by 10 to the 10 million power for me because it's just, it's that what is what it is. Look over at chapter 4. But that doesn't give us, we, we know what it is, but that doesn't give us the victory. See what I mean? That just gives us a, a, a source. And a, and, a, and a place to begin to deal with it. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 15. Right? You got that one? I'm going to read you Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You want to have joy and peace and hope? You got to quit remembering stuff. Get over here in the believing you got to take your mind, your 2 Corinthians 4, and you got to put it on something else. It doesn't mean forget their memory. It means I'm going to focus my mind. My mind's going to be stayed on Him. Look at 4.15. For all things are for your sake, and the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Boy, that's a wonderful, the abundant grace. Not just some, not just a little stream over here trickling down the mountainside, but what? The flash flood coming down the hill on you. The abundant grace. What is it going to do for you? It's going to, through the uh, uh, abundant grace, might through the thanksgiving of many. What are you to be thankful about in suffering? What are you to be thankful about in, 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 the, in the events of last year? His abundant grace. How about that? Duh. And I don't mean that mad, viciously. How about thinking about that? It's going to abound, redound to the glory of God. For how does it abound to the glory of God? How does it how how does how does it redound to the glory of God? For which cause we faint not. Notice that in the moment, what are we not doing? We're not giving up. We're not throwing in the towel. Let me say it like this. Do we want to give God the glory in everything? How do we do that? One, we don't quit. We don't faint. Okay? Second point, look at it. But though our outward man perish, what do we know about the, the circumstances, the environment that we live in? What's going to happen? You're going to get sick, you're going to hurt, you're going to die. Woohoo! Praise God, hallelujah. But what do you know? Where can you bring glory to God? Not quitting and understanding the situation. Considering. Reading the verses and believing the verses. Then yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Not just once on Sunday morning. I say that every time. It's every day. Wow, look at that. 
Outward man's going to die. He's going to perish. He's going to go away. That's why back up there in verse 7, this treasure's in an earthen vessel. Look back up there in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You know why he stuck it in you old dirt people? Dirt man? Dirt stuff? Stuff that can just go away? So that you understood where the power came from wasn't human made, it wasn't you, it's not in your flesh, it's in who you are in Christ. It's in His abundant grace. Verse 17, for our light affliction, got to go here. Our light affliction, can you imagine looking at what happened a year ago and saying that's just a light affliction? As it completely devastated a family, several families. Oh, that's just a light affliction, Rick. No, it wasn't. But what does Paul say it was? It was a light affliction. And it was only for the moment. Isn't that an interesting thinking process? Isn't that an interesting way to think about this? If it's only for a moment, then you know what needs to happen? You need to get over it and move on. You have to do it in your time. I understand that. I got that. They're in the day. Well, anyway. It's just for the moment. It's a light affliction. In the moment, it's hard. It's tough. But we, the mindset there, it's light. It's for the moment. The, the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's so much more coming, far better. It's a moment in time. But also, by the way, think about how he's thinking about this. Paul lived in great tragedy a lot. If you come over to 2 Corinthians 11, and you start... In verse 22, and you read down to the end of that chapter, he's getting the snot beat out of him almost every other day, if I can say it that way. We boohoo over something that happened a year ago. That's a mindset. That's a thinking process. Go back there to 417. What should our thinking pro what is the renewed mind of that inner man going to think about things in life? I'm back in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. What does the renewed mind, we're to renew our mind day by day. What is the renewed mind to think about the circumstances of life? When, my, when our Brian passed away, died in my arms, when that moment happens, I don't, there's not a day I don't go back by and think about that day. How am I supposed to think about that stuff? How am I supposed to work through that? How am I not supposed to, how do, you, how do you get to the point where it's not defeating you? Rather than it defeating you, rather than it holding you back, rather than it stopping you. You deal with it, you take it head on. And then you do what the rest of verse 17 says. You allow it to work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You take that event, you know, you understand what's going on, you consider what Paul says, you read the verses, and then the key is believing the verses. Joy and peace and hope in believing. And when you do that, then you take this mindset that we have, and you get that all built up in you. And you take it and you begin to apply it to whatever the situation is. And then you walk by verse 18. Having, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. Temporal. Look, folks, the year ago is gone. If it wasn't for a date on a calendar to be reminded of it, you'd never remember. It's gone. It's temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. You know what that verse is? That's, verse, that's chapter 5, verse number 7, right down the page. That is, for we walk by faith and not by sight. 
You want to know how you deal and defeat whatever the issues are in life? You got to understand where they're coming from. You got to under come over here and come over to 1 Corinthians 10. You got to understand where they're coming from. You got to understand that it's sin. It's a sin cursed creation. You got to understand that maybe you made a bad decision, a good decision. Maybe you're actually over here living godly. Maybe you are living in godliness. You're, you're doing 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, where godliness is profitable and the promise of the life that now is. You're living who you are in Christ. You're thinking like he thinks. You're doing what he's doing. You're delighting in everything he's doing. And as tragedy happens, and rather than letting it control you and letting it run you and letting it, letting it dominate you and letting it take you and just run you into the ground, you look at it as an opportunity to think about it the way God thinks about it. You take it as an opportunity to go and say, okay, Lord, what would you do in this? What would you have this be done? Let's make this work out for your glory and honor. That week, by the way, last year with that issue with David and Lisa, there were four other moms killing kids scenarios that had already happened. Three more happened after it that then never really made the news. So you know what tells me? That some of this is becoming common to man. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I don't understand. I'll be honest with you folks, from me to you, I don't know how a mom kills her kids. I just don't get that. That's unnatural in my mind. It just doesn't click. But it happened. And it happened to seven other families than just our family. How do you not let that beat you? How do you not let that just come along and just grind you down? Well, you let it work for you. A far more weight and exceeding power and glory out there, don't you? You take on a mindset. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but to such as common to man. Boy, that verse, you know what that verse tells you? A bunch of stuff, by the way, right there. One, you ain't special. God's not picking on you. Romans 5, verse number 1 says that because we're justified, we have peace with God. God's no longer going to shed his wrath on you. He didn't make the truck break down, the car go flat, the, the Lisa to do what she did, uh, the other people do it. He didn't make, Rick climbing mountains all day yesterday. He didn't make any of that happen. It's common to man. Because I wasn't the only one huffing and puffing on the mountain. Okay? It's common to man. Boy, isn't that a wonderful thing to understand? That we have the, the peace with God? That's tremendous. That sets everything freer a little bit. But the next thing, here's another point. But God is what? Boy, isn't that even better? He is faithful. What did he put on you when you were justified? A seal, didn't he? A seal of, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That in one day he's going to do what with you? Take you home, take you to glory. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. That goes back to that thing about being reasonable. We are looking at earlier. That's not an unreasonable request. He's not telling you to move mountains with the faith of a mustard seed. He's telling you to do what? Come and live as who you are in Christ. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape? Now, that'd be great if the verse ended there, because then what could we do? Dear Lord, please move this so we can get out of here, you know? Please get Rick to be quiet now, because we're dying over here, you know? It doesn't say, it says what? But that you may also be, that you may be able to what? Bear it. Boy. When he wrote that, he was thinking of us. Because you have to bear it. Interesting thing there. It's common to man. God is faithful. You're going to escape it by bearing it. You're going to escape it by considering what Paul said, reading the word, believing it, and moving through. You with me? Now there's four things here in this issue we're going to do real quickly. Get 2 Corinthians 1. Get 1 Corinthians 1. You need those two chapters. And we'll wrap this up. 
Get 2 Corinthians 1, get 1 Corinthians 1. God is faithful. How is he faithful? That's always been my little question in there. Everybody goes, well, you know, you preach that verse. I, I, how is he faithful? Now let's think about this. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, and let's look at verse number 3. Here's the first manner and manner in which he's faithful. 1 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. But by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Now, the us there is Paul and the guys in the moment that are with him. Okay? So our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Now watch this. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. For whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. The first way that God is faithful is that he gave us a pattern in Paul, our apostle. Paul says, what you see happening to me and how it worked out for me, you've got that pattern now to follow. You are to consider what I say. Well, Rick, Paul didn't have what happened to us happen. Yes, he did. He had guys waiting to kill him. Saints found out about it, led him down the other way. He looks over there, and he looks at those Thessalonians and First Thessalonians, and he says, I was worried about you, that you were standing for the faith. And you know what? I had to send Timothy over there to see how you were doing, and I got a good report. I was worried about you. Got Paul as our illustration. Hold on to 2 Corinthians, run to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 30. Second way that he's faithful is in verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know how else he's faithful? He's completely and totally equipped us in Christ. And he did it by the third point, which is by his word. He's given us his word that teaches us, it instructs us how to apply his thinking process to the details of life. We've been completely equipped in Christ. We're Colossians 2, 9, and 10, if you need another verse. We're completely and totally set, e equipped to handle the details of life. And then we have his word given to us that does what? That and teaches us, instructs us how to do that. Follow me? Now go back to 2 Corinthians 1. Actually, I need you in chapter 2. Well, 1 will work, and 2, and 7. <laughs> okay, it just it rolls, folks. It's, folks, when you get down and you get to thinking about something, pick the book up and just start reading. But don't read Matthew and James and Hebrews and Genesis and Malachi. Go over here and consider what Paul says. Look at, look at uh, 1 verse 3, 2 Corinthians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation. Well, why did he do that? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God has given you other saints who can come along, who've been there before, they've got the damage, they've got the scars, they've got the t-shirt. They can say, you know what, verse help me, come over to chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse number 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. You see how he's leaving? He goes over to Macedonia, can't find Titus. Come over to chapter 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 5, picks up where 2.13 just left off. 
Chapter 7, verse number 5, for when we were coming to Macedonia, well, 2.13, he's leaving to go to Macedonia. 7.5, I'm in Macedonia now. Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fear. Nevertheless, now watch this, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by opening the skies and raining down blessings on us. No? How did he comfort him? Who showed up? Titus showed up. Another brother, the brother he's worried about, comes and gives a good report. My point is, is that when you get stuck and things are coming down, God is faithful. How is he faithful? He gave us a pattern to follow. He gave us some books, 13 of them to read and to consider and to study and to learn and to believe and the equipping there. And then he gave us each other. And it's in each other that then those others get magnified and manifested and rooted down deep. So grace age suffering, it's going to happen to you. How are you going to think about it? How are you going to handle it? That's where the victory is. The victory isn't going out here and saying, I'm never going to leave my bedroom because... As soon as I leave, I didn't say house, I said bedroom, because in your bedroom, what's going to happen? Nothing can happen, even the boogeyman, he's out, because dad got him out years ago, he's out. So I'm going to stay in my bedroom, and I'm going to close all the windows, and close all the doors, and nobody's going to get me. It ain't going to happen that way. That's not handling it. Handling it says, you know what, I understand it's going to be here, that's the environment we live in. But God has equipped me through my apostle and his books written to me that you know what I can have every day? I can have victory in everything and in anything. In everything, give thanks. I can have victory right there. And whether it's been a year, five years, 25 years, or tomorrow, it's all going to be okay. And I'm going to allow the situation to then work for me and work in my life so that, you know what happens? Everything redounds to his glory. And when they look at me and they say, how, I tell people, my stepson passed away, he was only 35, and they just go, how how are you okay with that? It was about five years ago now, I think it was. How how in the world? And I said, well, I, I know where he's at. And then I give them the gospel, and they're going, okay, that's enough. (laughs) Seriously. I had a guy just last week, two weeks ago, do that. Not last week, but two weeks. You know, we were talking around the lunch table, the guys I'm working with, and they're like, you know, because his daughter's sick. And I was like, well, ma'am, I've been there. I understand. And and he's like, well, how did you get through it? And I said, well, I know where Brian's at, and he's in heaven, and he's looking at me just, huh? And I go, well, you know, Christ died for your sins. He goes, that's okay. That's fine. And he started talking about the ball game. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, Diamondbacks are winning. Woohoo! good. Let's talk about the ball game. If you don't want to talk about that, you, what do you do? You, it begins to work for you. But there isn't a day that I don't go buy a macaroni grill and go, well, oh, that was Brian's favorite place. So I sit and have a pasta. How do you win it, though? How do you get through it? right there. I think I got everything said. It's time to go home. All right? How do you get through the suffering? How do you get through the heart, the hurt? By the way, how do you get through the good times? Same way. Doesn't change. Just a little easier. Okay? All right. Don't Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for everything that we have in your Son. And Lord, I just pray that the Word will work in our lives for your glory and for your honor. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand. We're going to sing a song.